a reading from the second letter of St. Paul to the Corinthians. Brothers and sisters, whoever sows sparingly will also reap sparingly, and whoever sows bountifully will also reap bountifully. Each must do as already determined without sadness or compulsion, for God loves a cheerful giver. Moreover, God is able to make every grace abundant for you so that in all things, always having all you need, you may have an abundance for every good work. As it is written, he scatters abroad, he gives to the poor, his righteousness endures forever. The one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You are being enriched in every way for all generosity, which through us produces thanksgiving to God. Verbum Domini. Bless the man who fears the Lord. Bless the man who fears the Lord who greatly delights in his commands. His posterity shall be mighty upon the earth. The upright generation shall be blessed. Lord. Wealth and riches shall be in his house. His generosity shall endure forever. Light shines through the darkness for the upright. He is gracious and merciful and just. Lavishly he gives to the poor. His generosity shall endure forever. His horn shall be exalted in glory. Lexio Sante Evangelii Secundum Matteum. Gloria Tithi Domine. Jesus said to his disciples, Take care not to perform righteous deeds in order that people may see them. Otherwise, you will have no recompense from your heavenly Father. When you give alms, do not blow a trumpet before you, as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, to win the praise of others. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you give alms, do not let your left hand know what your right is doing, so that your almsgiving may be secret, and your Father, who sees in secret, will repay you. When you pray, do not be like the hypocrites who love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on street corners, so that others may see them. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you pray, go to your inner room, close the door, and pray to your Father in secret. And your Father, who sees in secret, will repay you. When you fast, do not look gloomy like the hypocrites. They neglect their appearance, so that they may appear to others to be fasting. Amen, I say to you, they have received their reward. But when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that you may not appear to others to be fasting except to your Father who is hidden. And your Father who sees what is hidden will repay you. 
Verbum Domini. The beginning of the book of Ecclesiastes proclaims, vanity of vanities, all things are vanity. Emphasizing the pointlessness of human activity unless God forms the center of our existence, whether staying in obedience to him results in temporal happiness, great joy, or perhaps great sorrow. This passage provides a frame of reference to keep in mind as we again join Jesus and his disciples within St. Matthew's Gospel at his Sermon on the Mount. We have been absorbing Jesus' teaching at the Mount for a while, all of last week and into this week. Through yesterday, we, would, we could consider we have assimilated part one of the Sermon on the Mount, which we could call the message of the kingdom, beginning with the opening statement of the Beatitudes, the kingdom's blessings upon all, and continuing with messages and teachings of how to fulfill the law. And now, we sit before Jesus as he begins teaching what we could consider part two of the sermon, how we are to conduct ourselves to store up the treasures of heaven, with today's instruction from chapter 6 of St. Matthew's Gospel of the proper attitude we need to maintain towards the religious practices of almsgiving, praying, and fasting. Now this reading should be very familiar to us. It is proclaimed at the commencement of Lent on Ash Wednesday and establishes the qualities of mind and character we should seek during our Lenten journey to the foot of Christ's cross and his glorious resurrection. And as we seek a renewal of our baptismal commitment and promise. As St. Peter stated at the transfiguration of Jesus, Lord, it is good that we are here. It is good we come back to this passage within the context of Jesus' teaching at the Sermon on the Mount to remind us and refresh us on a proper disposition of the religious practices of almsgiving and prayer and fasting. Now, almsgiving, prayer, and fasting are three pillars of Jewish piety. The Book of Tobit declares, prayer with fasting is good. Almsgiving with righteousness is better than wealth with wickedness. Jesus' teaching assumes his disciples are engaging in these practices. Note that he states in chapter 6 of Matthew's Gospel, when you give alms, when you pray, when you are fasting. But Jesus is concerned about the motive and the manner in which these religious practices are performed. He's very, very explicit in his instruction. Take care not to perform righteous deeds in order that people may see them. Otherwise, you will have no recompense from your heavenly Father. Jesus is warning not to do good deeds, just to be noticed. So as we are seated before Jesus, who is our rabbi, our master, our Lord, our teacher, we listen as he instructs us of the kind of spirit in which we should enter into the acts of personal piety, that of almsgiving and prayer and fasting. The spirit in which we should manifest our personal piety is actually one of heart. Our outward signs may imply that we are most pious, we may be seen raising our eyes to heaven. We may clutch our hands tightly in form of supplication. We may beat our breasts. We may kneel longer than anyone after Holy Communion. Now, all of these outward signs 
can be and are very, very good if, if we surrender to the Spirit and we are in the Spirit of Christ. But if inwardly, within our hearts and within our souls, we are spiritually dead, then, then we're more like some movie set facade. Looks good on the surface, but there's no substance behind it. So Jesus is actually challenging us to perform our acts of personal piety, actually all that we do in the course of our daily lives, to do it for the glory of God alone, with purity of heart, purity of intention, without seeking any recognition or any reward. What we do may never be recognized by this world, but as Jesus states, our Father, who sees in secret, will repay us through reward in heaven. So Jesus teaches us how to pray by purifying our intentions, ourselves, to bring us closer to our Lord and to our Savior, to pray more frequently, more fervently, to bring us in union with the one who can save us, as St. Paul advises, we must pray without ceasing. As Pope St. John Paul once exclaimed, don't stop praying. Prayer is a duty, but it is also a great joy because it is a dialogue with God through Jesus Christ. And St. Faustina records in her diary, a soul arms itself by prayer for all kinds of combat. In whatever state the soul may be, it ought to pray. A soul which is pure, a soul which is beautiful, must pray or else it will lose its beauty. A soul which is striving after this purity must pray or else it will never attain it. And a soul which is newly converted must pray or else it will fall again. And a sinful soul plunged in sins must pray so that it might rise again. There is no soul which is not bound to pray, for every single grace comes to the soul through prayer. But Jesus also teaches us how we should fast. By detaching ourselves from our material world and our comfort zones, fasting calls us to be ever more hungry for and turn our hearts toward him through our sacrifice. We recognize that all we truly need is God's loving providence. He will provide. We are freed from our dependence upon material goods, and we can experience his providence on an ever deeper level. But fasting goes beyond just abstaining, perhaps from a meal. Fasting can also involve letting go, letting go of anger letting go of distress, despair, the want or need or feeling for revenge, letting go and providing and giving it all to our Lord Jesus Christ to put it at the foot of the cross, to purify ourselves through that form of fasting. And Jesus also teaches us how we should give alms. Yes, by caring for those in need materially, there is a need, a great need, to share our abundance, but also to care for those who need us emotionally through loving expressions of kindness and forgiveness and patience and forbearance, to be that listening ear to someone who needs so much to have a chat or to have a shoulder to lean upon. All to bring us in a common bond with all of our brothers and sisters throughout our communities, throughout our nations, throughout our most troubled world, to imitate Christ by acting for Christ in love and charity. And one of the greatest resources we can share, even if we are not financially well off, but one of the greatest resources that all of us have in equal measure is time time which can be a most precious and scarce commodity for an over-busy world. 
time to be with each other in community, time to share to those who need us, with family, friends, and those who are in need. Jesus is most emphatic about how we are to pray and how we are to fast and how we are to give alms. All should be rendered with a purity of heart to be in intimate relationship with God and not be actions to impress our neighbors. The most loving act of prayer is when we go to our inner rooms and to our hearts and pray in total supplication to our Father. The most profound act of fasting is when only we and God knows that we are fasting. The most exquisite act of almsgiving is when we give in charity and with a loving heart, and no one, absolutely no one, knows except God the Father, and he knows what we have done. There's a poem written by Mother Teresa that many of us may have found in contemplation and meditation on Jesus' teaching in St. Matthew's Gospel. The poem offers, often appears when this gospel reading is proclaimed. The poem's name is Between You and God, and it's worth reciting here. People are often unreasonable, illogical, self-centered. Forgive them anyway. If you are kind, people may accuse you of selfishness and interior mo ulterior motives. Be kind anyway. If you are successful, you will win some false friends and some true enemies. Succeed anyway. If you are honest and frank, people may cheat you. Be honest and frank anyway. What you spend years building, someone may destroy overnight. Build anyway. If you find serenity and happiness, others may be jealous. Be happy anyway. The good you do today, people will often forget tomorrow. Do good anyway. Give the world the best you have, and it may never be enough. Give the world the best you have anyway. Why? Because in the final analysis, all of this is between you and God. It was never between you and them anyway. My brothers and sisters, if we properly dispose our souls and our minds and our hearts, we will take great consolation that our entire lives, all of our daily duties and actions, our prayers offered up to our Father, through our Lord Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit. The true reality is that our day will come when we will pass from this mortal life and stand before Christ, our eternal destiny, where we will be in that new reality, will depend upon that moment of judgment before Jesus. Will Jesus observe that truly we obtain great worldly recognition in the accolades of those around us, and thus we have received our reward during this very, very, very short stay here on earth. Or, or will he look at us and smile and say, welcome, welcome, my good and faithful servant, well done, come and take your rest.